All right, thanks for coming. Uh, like I said, my name is Jason, uh, and I'm a geologist for Green Diamond. So today I'm going to talk about uh, adaptive man a story about adaptive management, um, and more specifically, uh, revisions to our preven preventative uh, streamside landslide buffers on uh, managed timberlands here in Northern California. Uh, of great help to me on this uh, project was uh, Mr. David Lampier and Matt House. Uh, so the agenda today, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit about the background, the what and why of the Triple S, uh, our methods, our sampling scheme, field work analysis, uh, some preliminary landslide statistics, and uh, results which uh, have been approved by National Marine Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and then uh, expectations of our triple S buffers. So what is a triple S? What is a steep streamside slope? So uh, what it is is it's a preventative landslide buffer that is applied to steep streamside slopes that lead into a water course uh, on managed timberlands. The, the goal or the, the thought is to uh, uh, reduce the potential for streamside landslide on, on the related to management. Um, so our our trip lessons are specific across. We have a we have a vast uh, property. It's broken up into what we call hydrographic planning areas. That's what these uh, red red uh, amoebas are up here. And so our triple S buffers actually change across the property. They're, they are triggered by different uh, slope triggers and uh, they have different widths. So they're, they're specific to different parts of the property as, as appropriate. Uh, here's a cross section of, uh, and a cartoon of what, uh, what a triple S would look like. Um, on this side we have a, a triple S, on this side we have an RMZ for comparison. So in this scenario on the, on the right we have a steep stream side slope. So we, we've met that slope trigger and, and we're going to implement our, our triple S on this slope. So what that means is we're going to apply more uh, canopy retention in these areas. So um, we have this inner zone uh, that, that kind of mimics RMZ. And, and uh, we have elevated canopy retention there. And then if the triple S buffer is actually wider than an RMZ for a specific hydrographic planting area, then we would have a, a wider zone and we would have an extra zone of canopy retention outside of that, that core zone. So uh, we determine these, the, the, the slope trigger by looking at cumulative volume of sediment delivered uh, versus, versus slope gradient that the landslides failed on. And uh, the maximum width of the triple S buffer is uh, also determined by looking at cumulative volume of sediment delivered uh, compared to um, the, the distance from the main scarp to the water course. So, and I'll be talking about that a little bit more. So uh, why do we have triple S buffers? Well, uh, science and politics. So we have, uh, during the implementation, or during the development of our, our uh, aquatic habitat conservation plan, the, the agencies wanted to see something that specifically looked at uh, or addressed streams, uh, streamside landslides. And uh, you know, during that time period, there's a lot of studies going on and coming out. And one specifically uh, was a Redwood Creek study that showed that there was 65% of the sediment in the watershed came from streamside landslides, which is obviously a significant amount. So um, they wanted to address that. And this is this is the uh, this is what they came up with. Uh, the objective of the Triple S is to reduce uh, management-related streamside landslides by 70% uh, compared to historic uh, sediment delivery rates. So from that we came up with our steep streamside slope uh, delineation project. So what this did, uh, this is the adaptive management part of, of the story. This, this project allows us to, uh, to look at the initial study. The, the initial buffers were, were based on a quick and dirty study. They went to areas on the property that they knew we were a hotbed for landslides, and so they were intentionally biased uh, to produce big buffers, um, but, but to establish something in the, in the short term uh, for us to use. So 
So this study allows us uh, to adapt and, and uh, expand on that initial study and then eventually redefine what, these, what the slope trigger should be and the, and the buffer width should be so that we can apply that to the ownership for the rest, for the remainder of the HCP permit. So uh, sampling. So our sample, uh, we look at all our water, the water courses on the property. We're looking at uh, class one and class two water courses, so uh, fish bearing and non-fish bearing perennial flowing streams. Uh, we targeted 10% uh, of the class one water courses and 5% of the uh, two class two water courses. And what we did was we took our hydrology uh, on the property and we broke it up into half mile segments. And uh, we randomly, uh, we, we spatially distributed that across the property and ran, randomly sampled uh, half mile segments. Uh, like I said, targeting 10% and 5% uh, of those streams. So in some cases, the, uh, when you, you're busting it up into those half mile segments, you get to the end and you got these little straggler pieces. So with those, we, we grab those and we lump those into, into half mile uh, groups. So that's, that's what those end up looking like. <clears throat> um, in the end, we got a really, really good sample. As you can see uh, uh, all, these little, all these little colors here. They, these are the, all the samples across the property. We got a, a great sample set all the way across the property. We, we ended up with 357 uh, half mile breaches across the property. And so we went out in the field and we surveyed both sides of those uh, for landslides. And that's uh, 357 samples. That's uh, almost 200 miles of, of stream we walk. So, for the field work, or for, before we get to the field work, uh, just touch on the geology here uh, on the property. Starting down, uh, we have you know active tectonics going on in the area, so there's a lot going on down in the southern half of the property. We have uh, the wildcat group, so it's a young regressional sequence of the ancestral eel valley. So what that means is a lot of uh, sand, uh, poorly consolidated sand and gravel uh, throughout that area. Uh, and as you get farther north, you get into the Franciscan complex in this region here, you got a lot of uh, kind of a mixture of sandstone and melange. Melange is that, that uh, colloquial uh, blue goo that uh, everybody hears about, the mushy clay stuff uh, and some sandstone, sandstone mixed in there as well. And then as you get about here, farther north, you get into the uh, a little more competent sandstone called the broken formation. It's still sheared and, and fractured, uh, but a little more complicated uh, and presents a little more incised topography. Uh, our field work. So for the field work, this, uh, we address non-road related shallow landslides across the property. Uh, not road related landslides are addressed, uh, addressed elsewhere. Um, so once we're in the field, we took cross sections of each of the landslides on other data, but uh, cross sections were, were key to help uh, determine really good, uh, precise landslide measurements. We got lengths, widths, and depths of both the source and the, and the debris of our, of our slides. So we got, uh, we were able to calculate really, really detailed um, volume calc calculations, which we use uh, the equation that's uh, based on half of an ellipse. So once we had all that data, uh, we, we, we go to synthesize it, but before, before we got too far, I, I, we, we just got in LIDAR and, and uh, just being in the woods, you, you know, some areas look different from others and, and these buffers were supposed to be applied to, you know, these whole HPAs or groups of HPAs on our property. And uh, the first area we went to was the coastal Klamath and in the coastal Klamath, um, you can see some of the areas are really, really incised, really jagged topography, and in other areas in the same HPA, it's, it's a lot more muted. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I was curious, well, is, you know, it's gonna be appropriate to just have one blanket prescription for these areas. So, um, in, in trying to figure out what we should do, we took a look at uh, a topographic, topographic ruggedness model and uh, applied that to the property and, and as you can see here with that data it, there is a, a pretty good difference across across this area that that, uh, that is shown in this model um, 
We synthesized that, that data, the data from that uh, using Jenks Natural Breaks, a statistic uh, way of, of breaking up that data, and it broke up nicely into, into three groups. Um, although we weren't able to use three groups because we didn't have enough landslide data to, uh, to do that, and, and it, it really wasn't appropriate um, anyways. So we, the, two, the two, two of those groups we condensed into one, and, and we ended up for that initial HPA, we ended up with uh, uh, breaking it up into two, two zones with two distinct sets of, of triple S buffers, uh, buffer criteria. So once we got to the rest of the property, we looked at the rest of the property doing the, doing the same thing, and as it turned out, uh, the, the, the model showed that throughout the rest of the property, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty consistent, and there, there was no real need for that, uh, that level of, of dissection across the property. Um, and then the landslide data also supported that. So you look at, uh, so this, you know, the larger landslides really drive what these buffers are going to look like. And, and if you look up in uh, the coastal Klamath, which is up in here, you can see the bigger landslides are definitely in that, uh, in one zone, and then you get into the other zone, and there, there's fewer large landslides. So you look across the rest of the property, and, and these larger landslides are, are fairly well distributed across the property. Um, we did, however, notice that uh, uh, there was a need to switch up the HPA groups. Uh, initially, uh, the interior Klamath right here was lumped in with uh, what we call Corbell HPA group, uh, and, and uh, the southern tracks, these two down here, were their own, their own specific group. Well, in the end, we ended up lumping uh, the southern tracks in with the Corbell, and the interior Klamath uh, needed its own specific area, so it got its own set of, uh, set of triple S buffers. So uh, here's a breakdown of, of, uh, of the landslides across those HPA groups, and, and by HPA group and watercourse type, those are the number of landslides that we saw. Uh, in all, there was just over 2,000 landslides in this study, so a very intense field-based uh, field effort. And uh, <clears throat> through aerial fo photo analysis, we were, able to cap we were able to identify 369 of those 2,000 landslides, which is about 13% of the slides, a, a, a pretty good sample. And um, interesting note there, you can see there's definitely a strong suggestion that, that uh, there's a, a significant decrease in landslides over time. 85% um, of the slides were captured prior to the 1994 photos. 12% uh, were captured between 94 and 97, and only 3% of the landslides in this whole study were seen after uh, the 1997 photos. Um, right now we're going through our mass wasting assessment and looking at this stuff and, and I, I think this is really suggestive that uh, um, land sizes are, are decreasing and, and I, I think there's a, a, a good correlation with uh, management practices being a, a strong reason as to why that's happening. Um, by 1997, you know, there's, there's uh, riparian zones are prominent throughout everywhere. Um, before that, not so much. They're kind of, they're still kind of working in the system. And then um, when you get to 2000, there's even a, a, a more significant drop in land size, and, and that's when you had the T&I rules where, where the RMZs, where the riparian zones got even bigger. So I, I think there's, a, there's a, a strong correlation there. Um, again, 2,000 landslides. We hit our target in sampling. We got 10% of the class one uh, water courses. We got and we got 5% of the class twos. Uh, our class twos are broken up into first order and second order uh, re, uh, uh, classifications, so that each one of those has their own set of uh, triple S buffers. Uh, so we look here. This is another highlight of. Uh, a good reason why we, we broke the HPA groups up. Um, you can see here, uh, based on the, the, initial, the initial studies and development of the HCP, they chose 60% of cumulative volume to determine what the, the buffer lengths were going to be. This is, in this example, just for, just for the class one water courses. So if you look at the Smith River HPA group, um, the buffer came in just uh, just under 100 feet uh, for the Corbell group. It's uh, I believe it was 135 feet, and then for the uh, interior Klamath over here, uh, those those buffers uh, maximum buffers came in at 195 feet. 
for the cumulative volume versus uh, slope gradient, the, the, which determines when we when we implement the triple S, uh, use a cumulative cumulative volume of 80 percent. So that right up there, uh, the Corbell HPA group uh, ended up at 55 percent. So 55 percent slopes trigger that trigger that triple S, uh, and then for the rest of the other for the Interior Klamath and Smith River, uh, right here, those, those came in at 65% slope trigger. So uh, the results, um, as you can see down here, this is a really complicated matrix that tells you what all the, the slope trigger, the new slope trigger is, what the new maximum triple S buffer width is uh, that we have implemented on in these areas. and. Uh, we have redefined those HPA groups uh, to give a, a more site-specific protection morphology uh, to, to morphologically discrete areas on the property. Um, but you know, what, what all does this really mean uh, compared to the initial buffers? Did, did they, some went up, some went down, some of the, some of the slope triggers actually you know, got shallower, so we trigger triple S sooner now. Um, and some of the buffer widths got smaller, some of them got a little bit bigger. Uh, but in the end, uh, we, 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 we estimated that uh, we reduced the amount of triple S on our property by about 20%. So, which is uh, good or bad, I don't know, we'll find out, time will tell, but um, it makes sense. Because that initial study, like I said, the initial study was intentionally biased. It was, it was we were looking at areas that were prone to landslides and, and so, we would expect uh, with a with a more spatially distributed, statistically you know valid sample that you you would probably see those those buffers uh, shrink up a little bit. Um, expectations. So the triple S uh, is uh, is expected to uh, achieve a 70 percent effective uh, compared with historical sediment delivery rates. So. Um, again, that was something that was negotiated, and that's part of the AHCP, and that's that's the goal we're shooting for. Uh, like I said, looking at the initial sediment delivery rates, it looks great. Uh, you know, looking at those, those the de the decline in landslides that we're we're seeing. Um, you know, I, I said uh, you know only three percent of landslides were seen after 1997. We're also we're even seeing uh, right now we're seeing uh, a decrease, uh, an even further decrease since the implementation of our AHCP. So uh, right now things look great. Um, this will be tested. This we have a triple S assessment project, uh, which goes on for another 15 years and, and looks at these buffers to make sure that they're. And, and compare those to uh, similar areas to make sure that they're they're doing their job, and that's a <clears throat> that's a project that'll, that'll that will continue doing and and will re be reviewed by the by the agencies. And uh, that's uh, many of the uh, field crew involved with with this project that. that uh, we would not have been able to do. Like I said, we collected uh, landslide data on over. 2,000 land sites for this project, but we also coupled that with, with some other, our mass wasting assessment. So in all, there was well over 3,000 land sites that we collected data on. So uh, a lot of boots on the ground. Thank you. We have a break between uh, sessions, so if people want to ask a few questions, I think we could do that. Got 30 minutes. Do we have any questions? Must be hungry. <laughs> no questions? Oh, Rand. Uh, thank you. I'm just curious, how are you going to define success? Um, so you have a buffer that's uncut up next to a landslide margin. Um, what success? That all remains intact after 15 years, or can you enlighten us about that? Yeah, uh, so um, the triple S assessment project, it, 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 like I said, is we're, we're trying to, uh, the goal is to be 70% uh, effective compared to historic sediment delivery rates. So uh, what, we, what we intend to do is, is look at uh, historic sediment delivery rates, looking at um, uh, 
use an air photo analysis to determine to de determine what sediment delivery rates were before uh, bef before current day present management practices and and compare sediment delivery rates that we're seeing in our triple S buffers are, that we're monitoring and compare it with what we come up with uh, for historic sediment delivery rates. So uh, certainly there could be, uh, we, I mean I would expect that we'll see some landslides in those zones. So that's, um, we're not, again we're not, we're not trying to prevent landslides because that's impossible. Uh, we're just trying to reduce the potential for management related landslides. Could you just define historic? Define historic? 1887? Well we, have, we haven't defined it yet. Um, I mean that's part of that project but I, I, I intend to, to look at it basically through about 2000 because I think that's, I think that's before 2000, 2000, in 2000 we implemented the, you know, we California implemented the, the T&I rules which drastically changed, you know, the landscape and, and management uh, regime across the state. I may have missed it, but how are you separating out effects of drought and lower rainfall and the number of storms. I, I, what was How it? are you separating out the effects of drought, of lower intensity, less than lower intensity storms? For for the assessment part. Yeah, you're saying that your your um, number of landslides are decreasing as you yeah. um, uh, manage with the riparian zones and the protection zones. But still, we've had a period recently of less rain. Uh, in the immediate recent history, yes. But I, I'm since, like I said, since 1997, there's there's been a significant de decrease in the number of landslides, and we've had several major rainfall storm events in years uh, since then. It'd be helpful, I think, if you had. A correlation. To, to yeah. Share. Well, that's not a, any effect. For sure. I mean, that's not that's not part of this project. Uh, that's part of the mass wasting assessment, which we're working on right now. But yeah, for sure. Uh, and I'll I will be presenting on that. I'm sure in the next year. Thank you. Yeah. It was well, one of yeah. I can also allow. How your uh, triple S buffer compared to the size of the four practice school buffer? Are they greater than four or are they similar? I mean, yeah, uh, well, they like the the metrics I show. There's you know there's we have we have several, um, but uh, in some areas they're a lot bigger. Um, I guess size size is, a, is an odd comparison because the the force practice rule doesn't have anything to specifically address uh, or preventative landslide buffers the, you know the forest practice rules has um, RMZs you know your riparian management zones which is geared toward habitat where these are in addition to that so they they go on top of that and they increase the amount of uh, canopy retention in those areas so uh, you know in some areas these things are, are much larger than the RMZ and in some in some areas they're actually kind of tucked inside the RMZ how are you measuring loss? Are you doing any measurements on your screen? Uh, measuring the landslide itself. Uh, how much land, how much, uh, that was the best way to show that is the, there we go. Uh, through our cross sections, going out there and actually measuring the landslide, uh, the length and width and, and depth of the, of the slide and source area where the material came from and what still remains on the, on the slope and calculating the difference between those two. Yeah, so we'll go back. Um, oh, there we go. That's one I want. So in this inner zone, uh, there's so these are the zone we have a riparian slope stability management zone. In this inner zone, it's a no harvest. Um, whereas if you compare it to an RMZ, it would be 85% canopy retention. Uh, in the outer zone, it's 85% canopy retention. Uh, whereas if it was an RMZ, it would be 70%. Uh, 
and then uh, if, if the zone's wide enough and you, and you have a, an SMZ, then that area is a single tree selection, which is usually about 75 square feet of basal area retention. Any additional questions for Jason? Let's give him a hand. Thank you.